So look, how does it sound? First show at View Art Gallery. That sounds great. I mean, um, I think, is that what every artist aspires to have? Is like a, a solo exhibition? I think maybe that... I guess so, it is, depending on where it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, yeah, so for that, for that reason alone, like I'm pretty... Um, well, I'm super happy to have it here as well. So let's talk, let's talk about the collection. So um, I probably, certainly in the time I've been uh, running a gallery, I've never seen such an eclectic uh, collection of work. And, and I, you know, I've probably said that a few times, but I think this is upping the game a bit more. <laughs> um, and because, to me, it looks like lots of different artists. It's not just about mediums, it's not just about style, but about messaging and the feelings that you get from it and um it's it's almost a curator's nightmare but also a curator's dream um so i'm wondering how you see yourself as an artist and uh, yeah what kind of an artist are you when you think i'm an artist i think almost how you des described it as many artists mm -hmm. i don't think any one person is any one thing the medium kind of chooses itself for a variety of reasons. Well, yeah, so where does it start? Does it start with the subject? Does it start with the process? Does it start with, today I'm gonna to do some ceramics or today I'm gonna to do painting? Or, or is it, um, say, you say it finds itself? Um. I'd say there's no predetermined starting point. Um, it could be an observation, a response to something, or it could be the materials themselves that have the, the spark of the idea. Uh, I'm only going to use secondhand materials or things that I find, or uh, I'm not going to use or buy stuff anymore with which to make the work. And, that, and that's a conscious decision uh, for everything you do? So in some ways that is the starting point that you're, you know, exactly. you're, you're, you're not buying, you're finding, you're exploring, you're observing, and then what comes from that? is re exactly. your word reappropriated to to, uh, to to create a piece of art you just it's just about making marks until you see something in the canvas and then it's about taking away layers just as much as it is applying them um, so very much an evolutionary thing which which is is not untypical um, but what comes the difficulty or the challenge that often comes with that is um, w when's it finished and when do you stop? And I'm particularly interested, as an example, with this. I mean, one of my absolute favourite pieces is this piece behind us, the man in the telephone. Um, and I was uh, stunned when you said it's been going on for 10 years, um, uh, which I don't know whether that means because it was there, you just kept, it was in your studio, and you just kept enjoying playing with it, or whether it was unresolved use a, uh, a much used word but um, uh, yeah so, so we talked about the start where's the end how do you know where the end is well with a photo with a photograph if we think about the work as being a talking about the link between photographs and painting there's lots of back and forth it's the it's the painting talking about photographs and it's the photographs talking about painting because I was intrigued by that starting point of photography supposedly being in the, um, the Guild of St. Luke in Bruges, mm. where you have the mirror makers and the um, painters sharing a guild for the first time. And supposedly the camera obscura being kind of born in that place. Mm. And so there's this, there's this link that, you know, at the very start of photography, there were painters there and they kind of shared some stuff all the way through. So in terms of when is something finished, um, with a photograph, it's a moment in time. So it, it, you kind of don't have a choice over that. It's, it's, it's taken assuming to, no to post, capture that. Assuming no post-production work, which, well, you, that's which, another you, one which of my, you don't do with your, your fo any of your photos? or That's another one of the parameters I think that I've tried to set myself is that, yeah, there won't be any editing right. going on in yeah. the photo. We're talking like taking dust out and yeah. things like that to make the image uh, clearer and not um, scratched or something like that, then I'll do that. But I like the idea that when the shutter 
closes, yeah. that is the thing. So what's the equivalent of the shutter closing on that painting? I think they're just all fair game until they're sold. <laughs> That's the end point when they're sold. Yeah, so, I mean, I was uh, chatting to um, Michael Penny, the, the sculptor, the late Michael Penny, a while back when we were doing something similar to us sitting down talking about this now. And uh, he gave us a few examples of when painters would literally walk into galleries mm. and change stuff while it was hanging on the wall in a frame. And I think we both agreed that that was, that was right, that someone mm. should uh, and could do that. Um, and um, subject matter themselves, uh, again, with such a diversity of, of, of work and, and, and messages and, and, and medium and styles and everything, um, there are actually some themes. And uh, one of the themes uh, is flowers, which uh, you kind of look at the work and go, I don't see floral pretty pictures here, but I do see a lot of flowers. Um, where, where did that come from? If, if you'd have asked me that question a few years ago, I would have found the idea of painting flowers quite trivial. Mm and quite t twee and a bit uh, vanilla perhaps as a mm -hmm. thing to do and i probably wouldn't show them in <laughs> in here as a as a you know as a still life uh, you know pa painting it, it has its place elsewhere but not 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 in this gallery mm. but um but uh, but i yeah, suppose yeah. to to ex to you know now uh, I think it's gardening, actually, that has revealed parallels, actually, with painting. For me, the act of doing both, I almost kind of apply the same methodology to, to both things. You know, if you have a, a garden that you walk into for the first time and there's not much there, you have to start making decisions about this thing, just like you have to start making decisions about a canvas. And over time, things just grow in the garden and you've got to make a decision like, am I going to keep that thing? Like, is it doing something for me? Is it doing something for the composition? Is it doing something for the work? Does it make sense? Or am I going to tear that thing out and throw it aside and see what else grows? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's very similar to describing the method of painting for me. It's like, you have this thing, which I think why the starting point always has to be a thing. It can't be this pure, white canvas in front of you. It has to come from somewhere yeah. uh, as a point to react to. I love that. I love that um, analogy. Right? I mean, you know, I can start thinking that the garden is the, maybe the whole collection, the parts of it are the, um, or it could be a, a painting or an individual piece, but it could be a collection. It could be a combination of things where you're almost curating your garden in the same way as you're curating your series of artwork. Uh, yeah, that works for me. Like, yeah, and, the, like and having, the, having the studio literally at the point of, yeah. you know, it, you open the door, you, you're in the garden instantly. It's become, that place has become like a kitchen garden, workshop, gym, like all mm. of these things mm. together that you can do at the same time. They gradually just kind of bleed into each other. Mm. So I'm interested in your style of gardening because... Um, uh, Again, that could sound quite a twee answer in that, you know, gardening and I'd place things and I'd plant this and I'd pretty colours and all the rest of it. But there's, there's, for me, there's a certain amount of, um, there's some aggression in your work. Uh, there's all some playfulness, there's, there's all sorts of things in there. But one of the aspects is that there's scratching out, there's some gouging, there's some vandalism, there's some distortion. Um, is that how you garden? <laughs> no, but I think there is, particularly with the garden pentaptic, which is supposed to represent the sort of theatre of uh, flora and fauna. So you have, there is, uh, there is some drama in uh, the growing and dying of plants. There is some drama in the theatre of animals and things that just kind of find their way into this space that you're in there's death in this place yeah yeah and there's comedy and there's um you know there's this uh, it's just the things that you see and the way that they interact together 
um, yes, can sorry. be dramatic uh, and can be, you know, plants themselves, when you start working with things like plants, um, you know, they can be medicine and they can be poison, mm. right? There's this, there's this depth to things like that that are, don't come across when you first look at a bunch of, you know, bunch of flowers, how I'm describing them when I, if you'd have asked me that question a while ago. Yeah. Uh, that makes loads of sense. It's not, it's not necessarily your approach to gardening. It's what you see as, a, as nature and what's happening in the garden and observing beyond just the plants and the weeds and it, but all the rest of the uh, ecosystem in the garden. The other week I was looking out the, into the garden and up on a TV aerial, there was a crow. And then the crow just looks to its companion and then just swings upside down on the TV aerial and just, ta da, yeah. <laughs> just unfold its way. And it was almost like it was trying to show off to it. Your work has an incredible amount of storytelling in it. And uh, whether it's stories from observing in the garden and nature, also from your travels, also from people. And some of the, some of the stories that we've talked about are not trivial they're they're sort of quite they're deep they're dark they're emotional they're personal um how do you decide how much of that story to tell or how much is just inherent in the in the art itself and it and it comes through but maybe um in a less direct way yeah i think maybe the the things that you're not so comfortable saying out loud it's easy to create some sort of riddle around those things. I think we just do that anyway. Yeah, so there could, it could be a long story. It could be a short story. But every, every picture in this, uh, in this show tells a story of sorts. And particularly, say, this one, it's like a patchwork of stories um, kind of woven together. Um, so any of the objects in here or things in it take you down a different, a different rabbit hole. I think some things can appear dark, but again, a different layer to them. You have dark comedy, mm. right? The, the intent there is fun. Mm. You have like the aesthetics of say, punk or me metal music that are, that appear very, you know, there's an aggression there. There's a, um, there's a darkness, but in the aid of something else. It doesn't rely on perhaps this classical training that I've tried to, mm. I think didn't opt into, but then uh, the longer it's gone on, I've tried to avoid. So with the, with the sometimes hidden storytelling, um, it could be quite hard work for people to appreciate and understand what, certainly what you mean by the work um, without a good conversation or a chat like this um, or some written text about the work. Um, and it could appear inaccessible, or it could appear, uh, or they, people could take a completely different personal connection uh, from it and make up their own story. How, how much work and effort do you think people, or did you want people to make, and how, how much accessibility, easy or difficult, um, did you intend when you made the work? Well, I don't think, for a start, I have any control over the taste or sensibilities of other people, and like, nor should I. Um, but I think if I act uh, honestly and compulsively in the way I make things, then when someone does connect with it on some sort of level, then for me that's a, like a genuine connection that's happened. And, and for some pieces, you've, you've um You've gone into art history, some masters, um, uh, a lot of thinking, research, and quite academic. Do, do you need to be an art historian to enjoy some of the work? Regarding the masters, I think I try and, I like the idea of there being an echo in the work of something that is considered maybe like celebrated or recognizable or, or is in there already somehow. So that when you come to this work, you can see maybe what I'm trying to do with it. If you look at something like the sunflowers, mm. um, 
everyone knows what Van Gogh's sunflowers look like. They're on every piece of merchandise that money can buy. Yeah, I suppose with the, you know, I'm tr also trying to show this kind of lineage in art that happens. This almost reappropriation from one art generation to another. So you have a, this kind of apprentice model that happens with lots of the masters, right? They, they have a, a almost group of students underneath them that look up to this person. And, and we're also part of this very much a copy and paste generation now, I think. So for there to be a very clear um, thing that you remember from somewhere else in this is kind of a, a, it's not a nod to that, it's not a homage to it, but it's, a, it's an acceptance that that's a thing. Which, is, which it is all the time anyway, you know, I mean, it, it, consciously or not, we always build on, you know, there's no such thing as a brand new idea. We're mm -hmm. always building and I guess you're making that more explicit uh, if someone is aware of what, what you're doing that with. Yeah, but it's very much got to be an echo. It can't mm -hmm. be, I think the best covers of songs are the ones that they take the, the lyrics almost, but then the song is different. You can... Um, you notice the style of this new artist in the, with the resonance of the original there somewhere. Mm, yeah. And, and how much of your work is consciously autobiographical? I mean, I think that if you're gonna make things, you're gonna make artworks, they're almost autobiographical by default. You know, it's, it's basically, um, information or like an, an observation by a person, you know, scrambled with all the other things that are going on in there, and then um, put back out again onto a canvas. That artistic process for me is sort of quintessentially autobiographical, even if the, the, the object itself at the end of it isn't you know, about you as a person. It's just the, the process of it is, it just is that. And I, I guess that's why I use the word consciously. So I think the answer to that is, it, it's all autobiographical, but not in a conscious way. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so when, when, when I look at it and, and other people look at the, the collection, they're going to see, I think they're going to feel lots of different emotions, uh, e even in one piece. You know, they're, they're going to maybe laugh and think, oh, it's very playful and colourful and happy. Then they're going to see some other things in there that may be darker or more thoughtful. Um, does it reflect how you are as a person? For me, I th the way I think is that everything is on some sort of spectrum. You could take any one of these works and they may appear on a different point on that spectrum, almost like your mood. To me, that, there's a certain honesty in that. The, I think there's layers of ambiguity in all things, even if they're like designed to be definite, there's still ambiguity in them. Um, and so, yeah, I think I've tried to capture that in these, in these things as well. You know, does, um, you know, what, what's this guy doing? Why is he doing it? I think we've all got a slightly different answer. It's a reminder of a place I don't want to end up one day. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's a certain honesty to it as well. Like I got into um, the beer quite a lot, and I, I, I could see the future of that was almost this, this person here. And so all the tattoos on the body, to some extent, are different words for sugar that get put into food. Yeah. That, um, it's maybe not in a sinister way, like they're just made out of different things, but um, they're literally on the body of the person. Mm. I mean, getting back to the, the, the point around the meaning in the work. So uh, m many an artist will say, I have a meaning and other people might have a different meaning and I therefore I don't want to dictate what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling because everyone will make their own connection or not. And that's the, that's, that's the beauty of each person seeing something in a slightly different way. But when I speak to you about each piece, there's always a really interesting story. There's always something I'm going, oh, wow, I didn't, didn't know that. Or I didn't think about it. I thought something different. And it really adds to my uh, intrigue and enjoyment of the piece. Do you think 
it would be useful as for a curator to give someone a bit of that story to guide them on the way or you or you do you prefer people to come in with a completely fresh view i don't think i'm necessarily that precious about stuff like that i think in when i was studying something like curating it seemed to be that almost 50 percent of people were, were desperate for that story they were mm sort of clambering for it in a way that if it wasn't there, then suddenly the show was somehow a disappointment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other half of people were just like, leave me alone, I'm, I'm gonna figure this out for myself. I want this to be a relationship between me and the thing, not whether I can connect with this story or not. So I think there's almost a, a no good answer to that um, because it's someone else is gonna decide for you anyway. Um, I wanted to get to that. That's yeah. perfect. That's, that's what I've been trying to get asked that question in the right way to get that answer because I think that's what people are going to think when they come in here and now we've prepared them for that. Mm. So that's brilliant. Many artists are known for something. They often have a brand which is, oh, that's a Picasso, that's a Van Gogh. In, in your work, that is not an obvious thing. There's not an obvious thread to say, ah, that's 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 a Mitchell. That's a you know that, that belongs in this collection or to this brand. Is that something you think is unresolved, or is that deliberate, or something you're very comfortable with? I don't think I've ever really been that comfortable with the idea of trying to wrap myself up into being like a cohesive brand. I think if you if you apply it to say the world of work and this. Um, idea that to have a profession um, is to be one thing and to do that one thing particularly well. I just don't think that's how we're built as people. I think we're maybe like four different things all at once. There has to be a, a satisfaction in it. And to get that satisfaction, I think I have to do those different things. Related to brand, but really on a, on a, on a jovial level that's meant this this question is meant but you do have a brand and you've called it Duke Mitchell so uh, wh why did you do that uh, well basically it's as literally as simple as uh, if you type my name into Google the internet uh, I'm two people only to the internet one is a an actor on, who had a long career on Home and Away. May still be on it, I don't know. But just like a very heartthrobby, you know, type of guy. So he's taken up the first 600 pages of Google. And then the other one is a murderer. So that's taken up the other, like super subversive, like dark part of the internet. So that, that's, you know, mm. how it is. So, I quite liked, just like lavish vandalism, I suppose, the idea that by, by changing just a small piece of something, just the first letter, to, you got something that sounded a bit regal and a bit, um, maybe a bit more like an artist. Um, so that's where it initially came from. And I just, I suppose I've stuck with the name now. Uh, wow. And that's another thing that you have to do, right? It's, you can't keep changing these things otherwise. You know. Although you you're changing your art to not have a cohesive uh, style, message, brand. Uh, maybe you could have a name as well. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if the, uh, the algorithms would like that very much. <laughs> no, <laughs> no um, I was thinking of someone who's done that, but I can't, there, there was someone, but I can't think. I think you'd have to reach a level of... Yeah, notoriety. Just of notoriety yeah. and just absolute fame would want yeah. to do that. That the people are always making the links between the names rather than everyone being a fresh one from the start. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure their website stays the same, even if their nickname changes. Yeah. I th well, some, someone came in uh, to an exhibition we had once that was um, controversial to some people. And a, and a woman came in and she stood in the middle of the room and just said, this is all shit and walked mm -hmm. out again. I was quite pleased with that response because I think what the, wor the enemy, the worst thing you can possibly uh, have when you leave an exhibition is indifference. 
I, can, I absolutely agree. I remember the most... The, I would, yeah, I would rather this is all awful or um, the, whatever the opposite of that is. But I remember being at an art fair once and the thing that I found like absolutely crushing was someone walked past and, and looked you know, at this and was just... It's like it didn't do anything. And, uh, yeah, that was probably, you know, the worst feeling that you could have, or that I had. Um, but that, that's, you know, that's part of life. Like, that happens to all things all the time by lots of people. I've probably been that indifferent to something as well. I'm pretty confident that there are very few people will walk around and feel a sense of indifference. I'm quite confident that people would react strongly, positively and negatively, and you, you, you often get the, oh, my four-year-old daughter could do that, or you often get, oh, what, what's that about? doesn't make any sense. Or, um, uh, or, or people stand and stare for 20 minutes and just go into another world and all the extremes and things in between. And I think I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that's, that's, uh, that's, that's going to be a, the, the positive reaction, that, that there will be, not, not the positive reaction, that there will be strong reactions. Yeah, I, I, I certainly hope so. Um, to be a fly on the wall, like that would be that would be really really good, really interesting. We've got cameras. Yeah, <laughs> should I just sit in the back? And, <laughs> yeah. Right, I, I I I'm I'm done. And also that there was a bit in there that was a perfect end. <laughs>